Hey everyone, I'm so excited to be here. I've heard so many great things about Strange Loop over the years, and uh, it's just such an honor to get to talk to you about some of the things I've learned about security over the years. Um, so I'm going to be talking about building secure cultures. Uh, my slides are online already, so you don't have to take notes. There's lots of Creative Commons attributions in the link in the notes, uh, as well as links to various resources. So check them out. Um, also, quick content note: I am going to talk about plane crashes, but nothing graphic and like pretty minor, so how they're like investigated and, and solved. So if you're not a fan of plane crashes, just a heads up. So me, my name, Lee Honeywell. Uh, I work at Slack on the security response team there. I'm managing it. Uh, I used to work at Heroku, Microsoft, Symantec. I paint, and I'm sometimes a cranky feminist on the internet. Uh, I laughed a bunch when Amy apologized for being a lawyer yesterday. Uh, I was raised by a feral pack of Canadian lawyers, uh, and I think lawyers are really important for society. I think it's actually security people that need to, to be apologizing. Like, I'm a security person, I'm apologizing to all of you. It's also just partly being Canadian, so <laughs> sorry. That's how you know someone's Canadian. You bump into them, and if they apologize to you, they're Canadian. So we get told to move fast and break things. Right? This is like one of the mantras of Silicon Valley. But then this happens. Uh, it's a little hard to see the text here, but this is uh, some guy named Khalil posting on Mark Zuckerberg's wall. He tried to report a security bug to Facebook through their usually excellent bug bounty program. Um, you know, they misinterpreted the result, turned down the bug. He posted on Zuck's wall. And, uh, and then we get stuff like this. Uh, Harpley is a fascinating case study. Um, of the state of security response in the open source world. A researcher at Google, Neil Mehta, found the bug, uh, went through various like, proper channels to report it, um, you know, and it got like, shared with the Linux distros, the major cloud vendors, a few really important sites. When you read through a detailed timeline of the event, you start to see where the information starts to move around, and there's starting to be like, just enough information out there that other researchers go poking, and some Finnish researchers found the same bug. And it, then everyone was like, oh, the cat's out of the bag, and the embargo actually broke. So it was released a Monday morning instead of a Tuesday. Um, but I want to go back even further. This is a map of the world on July 15, 2001. This is the code red worm. Um, it exploited a vulnerability in Microsoft IIS that had been patched about a month previously. Uh, it was bulletin MS01033. And the reason I know those numbers is that I used to work, 10 years later, I worked on that team, the Microsoft Security Response Center. I handled security vulnerabilities in Windows, Office, SharePoint, uh, Skype, a number of others. And the, the thing that was pretty cool there, we had this whole set of policies and practices in place where we could work with external people to take in security vulnerability information. Uh, we had all this telemetry where if someone was using malware in the wild and it would cause crashes, uh, there's a great story in the notes, I'm not going to go into in detail, but really, uh, you, you would find these bugs that were being actively exploited, it would show up in telemetry and you'd be able to reverse engineer what was the vulnerability that was being, that was being exploited there. It was this methodical, ceaseless, every second Tuesday of the month and every once in a while a second time during the month uh, for emergency patches process of, of updating a billion computers around the world. Um, so if you, if you were running Windows in 20, 2012, I rebooted your computer. Um, and <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so in that job, I got to work internally within Microsoft with developers, testers, executives, PR, everybody, uh, coordinating shipping patches in Windows, shipping patches in Office, um, and working with the external researchers who were often reporting bugs to us. And then, you know, in the best cases, we would take the lessons learned from those bugs that were reported to us, cycle them back into the development process, and build more secure software in the future. And at Slack, we do something pretty similar. We have a bug bounty program. We're apparently at $177,000 in bounties paid out. Uh, it, um, we've had hundreds of researchers around the world report bugs to us. But this is, this is still an after-the-fact kind of thing. So it, it makes me wonder, like, what does it mean to build secure software before you're shipping it, right? Bounties, security response, all of this stuff is the cat's already out of the bag, your site's already, your site's already owned, your desktop software that you shipped already has a bug in it. 
Um, what can we do bef before we ship that, that code to, to make things better? So some of the things that that looks like in a, a culture, in, a, in an organization that has a healthy security culture, is you have developers reaching out to the security team when they're stuck or unsure about the implementation of a feature. You have developers finding bugs in each other's code, security bugs, during the code review process. You have a, a, enough tooling testing in place that people feel like they're protected from small errors or regressions. And one of the big ones, one of the big like organizational smells of a healthy security culture is you have people saying, like fessing up when they make a mistake about security, reaching out proactively to say, oh, hey, I pasted that AWS cred in the wrong window in a Slack DM, whatever. I deleted it and, and cycled it already, but I just wanted to let you know. Also, please don't put your Slack, your Slack tokens on GitHub. It makes me really sad. Um, <laughs> has anyone had a Slack token deleted from GitHub or that's been nuked uh, that was posted on GitHub? No? OK, we, we nuke them proactively. Yes? Yay, excellent. Um, so we proactively go out and, uh, and nuke those tokens. Um, what we're talking about here is complexity, right? The software that many of you work on is unimaginably and unknowably complex. With OpenSSL, we could blame the like, weird, janky export regulation stuff that people had to do, regulatory compliance stuff. Uh, but in any sufficiently large code base, you're going to have those weird, dark corners. You're going to make mistakes. We're human. We make, we're humans. We make mistakes. You're going to introduce security bugs. Um, one model that I like to think about in thinking about security bugs is, uh, and complex systems, it's called the Swiss cheese model of accident causation. It was first proposed by English psychologist uh, James Reason. He talks about the latent hazards in the system, the holes in the cheese, and how failure occurs when those holes line up and, and the error is able to pass through. In security and in testing, we call this bug chaining. I first learned about this book, this model, from the book The Digital Doctor, Hope, Hype, and Harm at the Dawn of Medicine's Computer Age, which I particularly like because we're not just at the dawn of medicine's computer age, we're really at the dawn of computer security's age, too. Like, we're, we are all beginners at this. Um, so what can we do about this, right? Like, we have these complex systems, they're error-prone, we're humans, we make errors. Uh, any different part of your computer system can fail. So how do we get to this like, solid block of cheese that errors cannot pass through? Um, in thinking about your system, you've got your components, you've got your tooling, you've got the humans involved, you've got your underlying infrastructure, data center, cloud, somebody else's computer, um, and each one of those is going to have holes. So all that we can hope to do is make them smaller, make there be fewer of them, and make sure that they don't line up. So here are some of the things that, as individuals, anyone here in the audience can do. The first thing is to go looking. Um, as a developer, there's a lot that you can do as an individual uh, to learn to make your code better from a security perspective, whether it's reading up on the latest classes of threat on the OWASP wiki, fuzzing your code with the adorably named American Fuzzy Lop. It's named after a bunny rabbit. Doing some static analysis, reading some books, or getting yourself some, some training in security. But fundamentally, though, it's a mindset thing. You're putting yourself in the attacker's shoes. You're saying, if I had control of this input, as I'm thinking through these data flows, what kind of problems could I cause? What shenanigans could I get into? And going from there. So back when Vista was under development, everybody's favorite operating system, um, the powers that be at Microsoft paid a bunch of external developers, a, a bunch of external security researchers uh, to do a full code audit of all of the new code. Um, and they actually ended up slipping the release of Vista because they found so many bugs. It was, it was a big project. Um, but the interesting part of the story to me is in 2011, I saw a talk given by one of these testers named Kristen Padgett. Uh, her NDA had expired, and she's like, I'm going to tell all, I'm going to spill all the beans. It was great. Um, so the, the things that she was able to develop um, in doing this massive, massive scale code audit, there was no way that even with the pretty large crew of security folks they had, they couldn't go through every single line of code. So what they did was they interviewed teams, and they developed a really strong sense of security smells. So secu the security smells that she talks about were things like people's body language, uh, whether they seem calm or anxious as they're talking to security people. 
um, confidence or lack of confidence in describing the functioning of their component. And so as they worked with these different developers, PMs, different folks around the Windows organization, uh, they were able to say, oh, this is code. There, there be dragons. There be dragons here. We got to dig into this code. Um, and the effectiveness was shown by just how many bugs they found. So it, as like a self-awareness thing, when you're writing code, paying attention to that gut feeling, paying attention to that, like this, this, this component is keeping me up at night, um, not ignoring that. And when you have that feeling, asking for help, whether it's from your security team, a peer, doing some additional research yourself, but following those hunches, following that, you know, developing that sense of smell for your own code. And if you reach out for help within your organization and you get shot down, like, that's a pretty useful signal too. Maybe not a great one, but yeah. So the other thing that I love to tell people about if they haven't heard about before uh, is capture the flag. So there's all these hacking tournaments that people put on. Um, and uh, I'll have some links next, but it's basically like Jeopardy style board. There's here's the 100 point reverse engineering challenge. Here's the 200 point web, web app hacking challenge. And it's a great time constrained way of learning new security related skills. Um, CTFtime.org has a great directory of them. To get a team going, all you really need is some form of chat room, I'm not uh, agnostic to what kind, and, uh, and a Google Doc. Um, I will note that security is maybe like 10 years behind the rest of the world when it comes to like having welcoming environments and often if like the event has an IRC channel it'll be kind of foul. Uh, it's still worth it to me but heads up. And then beyond just what individual things people can do, uh, I think it's really important to think about organizational processes. So more stuff I learned at Microsoft. Uh, they have this security development life cycle. It's this sophisticated 100 plus procedure thing, compliance thing that people do. Um, despite its complexity, there's a lot of really interesting stuff uh, that people can learn from it. It's all Creative Commons licensed and worth checking out. But it's, it's gotten me thinking a lot like, this, this is great when you're, shipping co when you're shipping Windows every two years, when you're shipping Office every two years. But it's less feasible for, for those of us in the room who ship code every day or multiple times a day. So the, the big thing, that my sort of, the MacGuffin I've been chasing for a couple of years at this point is, is what does this look like when you're shipping code multiple times every day? So I've been thinking, what's a minimum viable SDL going beyond this big process to what, what anyone can implement in a small organization? And I've come up with these four things. A risk assessment up front, getting people thinking about what the security posture of a particular feature they're working on is. Doing some threat modeling. It doesn't need to be very formal. It just needs to be, I'm thinking through the data flows of my project uh, up front. A checklist, and there's a ton of different resources you can use to build those checklists on your own, whether it's the Mozilla secure coding um, checklist, the OWASP resources, or Microsoft's own SDL taking the parts from that that makes sense for you. And then having whatever security tooling is appropriate for, for your code base, whether it's in your build or CI process, static or dynamic analysis, getting those tools in place. So here's what it looks like at Slack. Um, we've built a self-service SDL that any team can go in and create an SDL project for a new feature that they're working on. It's been a team effort. Uh, our head of product security is my friend Ari, and he couldn't be here, but uh, this, is, this is as much his work as it is mine. Um, but you start talking at pro about process, life cycles at, at small organizations, and people freak out. Also, because this is the section where I'm talking about Slack stuff, there's a lot more emojis coming up, just heads up. Uh, you know, you're, people are like, oh, what is this process? I don't want process. You're adding friction. You're slowing me down. And, so you get this conflict between security and dev, but it doesn't need to be like that. In fact, I want it, I want it to be more like this. Some people may recognize our bus ads, but yeah, that's what I want security to be like that. Is that, is that so much to ask? So what, is, what does that actually look like? 
For us, it's, again, that initial risk assessment. Um, this is something that the Microsoft SQL team pioneered, uh, and I worked with them a few years ago, and have sort of carried this with me. And that's the, instead of two weeks before you're shipping, you're like, oh gosh, I have to do all of the security stuff. It's getting people thinking about it at the start of the project and throughout the process, rather than just on that, that last crunch. So we have this little quiz that you do. It's only like six questions long, and various answers will dump you immediately into high risk. Or you can just put yourself into high risk by saying yes, or I'm writing SQL injection. Uh, <laughs> and so the questions are pretty straightforward. Um, and once you've got that risk rating, it, it's going to generate, um, oh, it's going to go through the component survey. So the component survey allows people to opt in to uh, the, the things that they're doing. So if there's no mobile aspect, they uncheck the mobile part of the checklist. So the checklists look like this, super straightforward. Um, and you can uncheck that everything is checked by default at the top level. And you can check the specific things, the sub subtopics that you need. And you can uncheck the top level things you don't need. But we, we encourage people to err on the side of, if you're not sure about it, just leave it checked, because you can move it into the, I don't need to do this column later. And like nobody gets mad or anything. So before I get to checklists, this is the part where I talk about plane crashes. Um, so uh, any, any fans of the air crash investigation show? in the room? Ah, uh, yeah. I'm okay, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not the only one. So checklists are a huge part of aviation safety. Um, and if you want to see really the, the thing that is so great about the air crash investigation show is there's like terrible things that happen, and then competent humans show up, and they investigate them, and they make processes so they never happen again. And that's why like air travel is safer than any other kind of travel, pretty much. So. Um, most aviation accidents result from human error, uh, and one of those root causes is often a failure to comply with checklists. But these checklists also prevent a ton of accidents. So when we were thinking about uh, how we were going to des design this process, design these checklists, we wanted to, to learn from the human factors stuff of aviation safety uh, for, like, why do people avoid checklists? Um, what could we adapt from that? So uh, my, my colleague read the entire 300-page report from the FAA on human factors in the use and design of checklists. Uh, and we went through that, and we're like, what are the parts of this that matter to security? So there, were, uh, a, there was like ac some fundamental stuff of where checklists fail. It's failing to use the checklist, uh, failing to verify the settings visually, being interrupted is a big one. So some of the things that we incorporated into our own process uh, were oversight of the completion of the process from the security team. Um, the security team uh, being involved and being tagged in at different parts of the process, making the tasks as simple as possible, uh, and I'll go over this a little bit more, but they, they're affirmative statements. Uh, I'm not, or yeah, they're all affirmative statements. Rather than I'm not doing the wrong thing, I am doing the right thing. So, and then we also have the feedback cycle from the bug bounty. When our checklists fail, we usually hear about it pretty quickly, which is nice. And if you don't feel like reading a 300-page FAA document, I definitely recommend Atul Gawande's The Checklist Manifesto for a more, um, slightly less dry version <laughs> of a lot of the same information. So here's what our checklists actually look like. Uh, first of all, once you've gone through that, um, the, the generator thing, uh, it starts generating some Trello boards. Um, takes a little while. And then you get a board of all of your different checklists for, um, for the different categories of security things that you need to, to, to deal with. Then there's a checklist for adding your uh, Trello board to Slack. It's not the most elegant part of the process. But here's what some of the checklists actually look like. So we've got regular expressions. And then we've got alert and warning messages. And the alert and warning messages stuff is actually taken from the Microsoft SDL, because their guidance was really good on that one and relevant to what we do. And then we can have like a visual overview of what's been checked off and what hasn't. And most importantly, because you've, we've connected it to Slack, we have our nice little SDL bot that tells people in your feature channel. You've connected it to the feature channel for whatever the project is. We have a lot of feature channels at Slack. We have, we have a lot of channels in general, like a lot. 
it's kind of bad. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so here you have a couple of examples of how what this looks like. So we checked off a checklist item, and then Mary's like, hey, Josh, I don't think we've actually, uh, we're not ready to check that one off. Can you leave it unchecked for now, and we'll come back to it? Um, or Josh is verifying with the rest of the team that this particular item has been correctly correctly dealt with, we've disabled DTD parsing, yep, okay, I can check that one off. So there's, there's that sort of, you're, you're bringing the security stuff to where people, where people are actually working. And the reason this matters is that it, it moves away from that one poor tester who has to do the 120 item checklist two weeks before the launch to a collaborative enterprise, to a collaborative effort of people working together to make sure that you're shipping secure code. Um, and it also means that as teams are working on their own, getting through uh, a particular set of checklists, if they're, if they're ever like not sure how to do things, they just tag us in. Um, so here, the team is asking Maria for help with a particular UX decision that has an impact on security. Uh, Maria, Maria brings in, hey, here's an example of how a third party does it. That, that would work well in this case, I think. And then the team is like, oh yeah, that, that totally fits our purposes. And Maria just pops out, doesn't need to be lurking in that channel all day. And then we're able to get ongoing feedback about the impact of this, uh, of this process on teams, on, on the work that people are doing, because we have the bug bounty, because people are able to just file bugs in the SDL process itself. Internally, the, um, the rules are all just JSON files. Uh, that live in our GitHub, so people can, we can accept PRs, often grammar edits, uh, <laughs> from the rest of the organization. And we're able to, we're able to, to move the, the secure development process quickly, not just move our general software development quickly. So that's what we've done as an organization. But then there's also the question of, like, what, can, what, are, what are the cultural factors um, at work? So there's a number of things in terms of the way we, we, we create cultures uh, that affect the security of the software that we produce. And holding ourselves, those among us who are leaders in our organizations, which I suspect is many of you, holding yourselves accountable for the cultures that we create and the impact on security that it has, um, it's pretty standard like blameless culture stuff for any fans of, uh, of Etsy's code is craft blog. Um, this quote may be familiar, but operating from the position that people want to be writing secure code uh, is like, that's the starting point, right? People, people don't want to be the one who ships the code that has XSS in it. Um, so we need to be able to figure out what, what, do, what resources do we need to get people so that they can ship, co ship secure code, whether, whether it's time, training, or external expertise. So recurse center, social rules. Um, security teams super often guilty of, well, honestly, all of them, but really, like, let's talk about feign surprise, right? How, how didn't you know that that would cause XSS? Like, duh. How, who's, who's heard something like that from their security team? Right, it's, yeah. So if, if there's one thing that I, I tell other security people all the time, I, I, like, hold that sign up in their faces and say, like, don't, don't do that, it's not necessary. That, that piece of feigning surprise, like it just, as, as the rules say, it has no social or educational benefit. When people feign surprise, it's to make themselves feel better and other people feel worse. It's about making other people feel smaller. And that's not how you build a safe culture. That's not how you write secure software. Um, fundamentally, writing secure software requires a level of emotional safety. Uh, I've often had the experience of trying to talk to a security person feeling kind of like trying to pet that cat. Um, and I say that as a security person. Uh, <laughs> so there's this idea of emotional labor that it is actually work to give gentle feedback, to be kind in the feedback that you're, you're giving to other people. It is also emotional labor to be receiving feedback, to be open to hearing that maybe your baby is ugly. Um, and, but this isn't, this isn't just like, this isn't just pie in the sky, like, let's, let's all get along and write secure software. It's actually supported by some of the social science re research into 
code quality. And when it comes down to it, writing secure code is writing quality code, and writing quality code is writing secure code. So if we are kind in the feedback that we give, we are building a culture where it is safe to say, I don't know what I'm doing here. And when people are able to say, I don't know what I'm doing, they get help, and then the code that they write is better, and that includes security. Um, yeah, nobody likes being, nobody, likes their baby being called ugly, but we need to establish, to reestablish that trust as security people, uh, because people need to be able to hear if their baby's car seat isn't plugged in or the seat belt is frayed uh, as otherwise disaster. So being able to create a culture where you don't get torn down for saying, I don't know how to prevent XSS in this, this particular code path, um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done on the security side of things to rebuild that trust. So, Coming back to the digital doctor, I really like this quote because it cuts to the core of why we need to be able to have trust in each other to do security. We need to be able to talk compassionately about the ugly parts of our code if we have any hope whatsoever of it being secure. Um, and I talked a lot faster than I expected, but again, there are slides available and yeah, thank you very much for listening to me talk about secure software.